Hey everyone, welcome to Group Text. It's a little bizarre that when I say Olympic gold medalist, it is just one line on the resume <laughs> of, of my guest today. I mean, that's usually the peak. But Tara Lipinski is also an accomplished producer, documentarian, commentator, actress, and now TV host with her own new show, Wedding Talk on the Chicken Soup for the Soul streaming platform. Welcome, Tara. Hi, thank you for having me. I mean, it is kind of bizarre that that's like a, oh, and she was also. <laughs> it really is crazy when I think about my career and all the twists and turns and, and adventures it's taken me on. I think, you know, I feel grateful though, because I think why it has is because it, it had to, because I started so young, you know, I was 15 years old when I won my Olympic gold medal. So I, I definitely had to figure out what was next and figure out how to evolve and, and figure out the next part and chapter of my life. <laughs> well, there's so many chapters. I'm just going to try and go kind of in order okay. so we don't bounce all over the place. Okay, you just said you won. You were the youngest ever at 15. That was Nagano in 1988. 98. 98, sorry. Nine, that's what it says. If I could read today <laughs> in my notes, that would help. 98. What I, I, I always wonder, because I was actually just talking to someone about for comedians, like the first time they do a major show and their standup goes well, it's like they hear silence after. What was the thought, your first thought when you realized you had won the medal? It's just such a surreal moment, you know, and I've I had won nationals and worlds before that, which are obviously uh, you know, big accomplishments, but it was so different because this one event, the Olympics, you know, for Olympians and for people that dream of going to an Olympic games or potentially standing on top of the podium, it's a lifelong dream. And even though I was so young, my entire life, I had dreamt of this moment. And then all of a sudden at 11.02 on February 20th, you know, your life changes forever within a matter of four minutes. And it was just such a surreal feeling that I think I don't really always know that it happened. Even to this day, it feels like a dream. It feels like something otherworldly because, you know, one minute your life changes and all of a sudden you have what you dreamt of and, and it all went perfectly, which seems miraculous if you think about it, skating on, you know, a thin blade, yeah. one small mistake would have changed the course of that. Do you think being young helped you? Because you don't have, I mean, most people at that age, especially if they've been in a sport where it's been your life, you almost don't process the level of nerves. You know, for so long, I used to say, I think it helped. You know, it gave me a, a sense of fearlessness that you have only when you're young. But, you know, I I feel like in my older age now, I, I actually have a different perspective on it. I think it was actually harder. I think because I was so young and looking back at how I dealt with, you know, the obstacles and the ups and downs of my career are so different than how I deal with them as an adult. Um, well, I hope so. I hope you've grown since you were 15. Right. But in the way that like I had to be an adult at 15. That was my day job. That was, you know, I had a team around me. I, I, I was working from pretty much six years old and looking back, I just don't think I had, you know, the perspective that comes with age. So I think it made it a lot harder because for me, it felt life or death. It felt that if I didn't win or if I didn't land a jump, my life was over. You know, it's like you, you're in high school and you, you break up and you think, my first breakup, I'll never love again, it's over. And you have these very dramatic emotions. And I think for me, looking back at my career, it if I had a more adult perspective and if I had life experience behind me where I've realized skating is so important, but it's not everything and I'm gonna be okay if I don't win, I'm gonna be okay if I make a mistake. Um, it would have uh, been a, in a lot, a, a lot more comfortable of a journey where I look back and I was stressed as a kid. <laughs> well, I, I mean, if you think about it, you know, 15 year old teenage girls are not the most emotionally stable humans to start <laughs> with. Everything is life or death. Everything is right. very big. Right. And that, and that's hard to do when you're on a public stage and you're, 
you're skating, you know, on ice that's slippery and it's not, not always going to go well. And I think that, you know, looking back, I, I, I definitely think that was, um, a struggle for me. And I, and I think that I took it so seriously that I, I wish I could have had a little bit more levity and a little bit more understanding uh, of what was happening. But again, you're 15, you know, that just, that comes with age. Um, Did you really stand on your parents' Tupperware while watching the Olympics and, (laughs) and, and receive imaginary medals when you were little? Well, see, the story is really taken taken on a life of its own. Yeah, yeah, with with medals and things like that. But I did. I asked to stand on a Tupperware bowl uh, because back back in the day, you know, in the 80s, 90s, the Olympics, you know, everyone watched every family sat around and watched the, the, the ceremonies, the podium ceremonies. And I just loved it with the music and the flowers. And so, yeah, I, I that that's a true story. But it got a little out of hand with you know, receiving With medals. time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you started ice skating and roller skating at three. How many pads did your parents put on you? I could not imagine. And you're, a, you're, I could not imagine how many, I mean, I know what I did to my son when he would skateboard yeah. and he was already like seven. Yeah. No, but I feel like also back in the day, it was much more just, you know, go out and take a tumble. You yeah. Know? Go ahead. Crack your head open. You don't need a, you don't need a helmet. Yeah. It's fine. I mean, when I started skating, the greatest part was I, I really got into, I got into it for a free care bear because my mom and her girlfriend who had a daughter the same age as me, um, it was in the newspaper of like, go to this local ro- ro- roller rink for a, a group class and you get a quick care bear. And, you know, in the eighties, I was very much into a care bear, but it was fine print of after 12 lessons, Um, so we stuck it out for the 12 lessons and my mom has that Care Bear frame, the Care Bear from hell in, in her home. (laughs) Little did you know that a Care Bear was going to launch your entire career. Did you do any other sports as a kid? I tried a lot. My parents put me into a lot. They weren't into sports, um, themselves. So I feel like they really wanted to give me that opportunity. So I tried gymnastics and, um, soccer and, you know, all of the things, but, nothing really stuck. I, I had a hard time. My mom said really staying motivated to want to go back to certain sports or classes. And with skating, I was hooked. I loved it. I love, it was such a social thing. We put on these shows, we did dress up and choreography. So it was, it was something I loved from the start. I'm always curious for someone who achieves something like at, at such a young age, like you did, what kind of kid were you? Did you rebel? Were you cranky? You know, I I look back at my life and I'm like, oh man, my son is so much easier than I ever was. Oh my goodness. You know, I think because I think sports shaped me a lot where I was just a little probably a nervous more on the like nervous Nelly wanting to be perfect side of things. So I really didn't cause, I can say this, I did not cause my parents any problems. I just like, they told me like, you cannot drink until you're 21. And I, I just thought that that is a hundred percent. I cannot. And I never did. And I was a, a bit of a rule follower, but what's funny is, you know, I feel like later in life, I feel like when I hit my thirties, I finally was like, Tara, it, you know, just gotta loosen up a little bit. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta have some fun here. <laughs> when I was thinking about today and I'm like, gosh, she won at 15. It struck me, you you won an Olympic medal before you had a driver's license. Mm-hmm. Which is insane. Which was more nerve-wracking. <laughs> Getting Definitely past- the Olympics. I mean, nothing will ever compare to that. I, yeah. I, I use that as like a gauge for whenever I'm nervous about something. I just take myself back to that moment. And somehow I'm like, okay, I'm fine. Whatever else you throw at me, I don't have to go stand center ice in front of a million people. So, it's so basically fine. during your driver's test, you had the window open, a cigarette and a pair, set of sunglasses and driving with one hand. Is that, how, is that how that it. went? <laughs> um, you know, something people always talk about, and I always have known that uh, ice skaters are such athletes, but you have to, you know, it's a little bit like gymnastics. You still have to stand there and look pretty and smile do you train for that that you have to practice doing that that you're not making like a grimacy concentration face you know while you're spinning at ridiculous amounts yeah 
you know, know seating is a, it, it's a, it's a performance and it's part of our score. So right from the start, you're just taught that you know one minute you're running around at 20 miles an hour across the ice, jumping into the air and turning three times. In the next, you have to be a ballerina. So you do you do all the off ice training for it, all the ballet, and you just you you become very body aware um, of what you need to bring to to get the scores you want. But that doesn't mean you can train your face. No. Well, yeah, I feel like you have to. Like, there, that was part of it. It's just like you knew you had to be performing. So right. that was part of the the act. It's so hard, though, because I know even just like working live and things are going sideways and this, it's really hard sometimes to just keep smiling through Smile. it where what you want to do is scream. Well, it's horrible when you make a, you know, a, a horrible mistake and you're on the ice and you have to get up and you have to then get back into character, which could be this, you know, lively, happy character that you have to get back into. And you're like, oh, just shut off the music already. <laughs> yeah. You retired from, from uh, competing very, very young. Mm -hmm. Why? You know, I, I think people are always so confused by it, but it was just a different time in our sport. We, you know, in the in the early '90s, skating, figure skating was huge. It was at the height enormous, of enormous, enormous. It would rival football numbers with all the different types of productions and shows and made-for-TV events that that they had. And you know, it was right after Nancy and Tanya, and all of that attention came. And and I I was skating at the time, and that was in '94, and then my Olympics was in '98. So the opportunities were endless. And at that time, growing up in the sport, you looked at Christy Yamaguchi, Oksana Bayul, all of these skaters that because there was so much opportunity, they didn't stick around for more Olympics. They immediately went on to skate with Scott Hamilton with stars on ice and champions on ice and do all of these professional events, which you couldn't be amateur and compete anymore. So I feel like when I was a little girl, I have pictures with Scott, you know, Hamilton going to stars on ice in my big blossom hat thinking, oh my gosh, one day if I win the Olympics, they'll ask me to go on tour. Um, so for me, it was always a no brainer. As long as I accomplish, you know, hopefully winning that medal, I just had hope to move to that next, you know, glamorous phase of, of figure skating at the time. Do you ever look back and regret it? To, to move on? To move on that early. Oh God, no. No, it was the, for, for so many reasons. A, I, I, you know, skating's popularity is not the same. And I was able to the next, you know, five, six, seven years on Stars on Ice really get to live skating at its best and perform around the country and, you know, to sold out Madison Square Garden and, and become an entertainer and work with Scott and Christy and Katarina and all of these amazing people that I looked up to. And by far, those touring years were probably the best years of my young life. I will, I think back on them so fondly, but then more, more importantly, I think that I'm so glad that I, I had to move on. I had to figure out what was next because that prepared me to keep doing that in my life where you see that Olympians really, I mean, all athletes, but uh, you know, especially Olympians and niche sports, they really struggle that all of a sudden at 28, they re retire at 30, they retire and their entire world is turned upside down because all they know was that one thing. And all they know is how to go to a, a, a training center and compete. And for me, I kind of stayed on track with kids my own age of going to school and, you know, figuring out life after school. So I'm grateful that I did it that young. So I was forced to like move on with my life. Was it hard to go back to normal life or did you never really had normal life? I never really had normal life. And I still think, you know, my life is still different. So different than a normal life from skating. But again, back to my point of like retiring from the amateur world at 15, going into the professional world, it was still not normal. You know, we're flying all over the, the world for these shows. But at the same time, I it's normal life seeped in slowly. You know, I wasn't training those hours. I was able to go to a Starbucks and think like, oh, this is what people do in the morning. They walk in and they get, get a coffee and they sit down <laughs> and they're not training all day. So, you know, I was slowly getting adjusted to a normal life. Did you ever go to a traditional school? I did. So I, so my parents were not into sports and, um, they didn't understand the homeschooling thing at the time. And it also so, wasn't as big of a deal. Right. 
Right. And I, I went to, to school in class, but it was getting out of hand. I was having to wake up at 3 a.m. and skate because like the rink didn't have enough ice time and skate from 3 a.m. to 9 a.m. And I was getting hurt. So eventually, um, instead of doing a typical homeschool, my dad and my mom kept me enrolled into my, my high school. And I had three tutors that worked with the school. And every day I was on the same courses and, and, and doing everything that my, my friends and students that actually went to the school did. So it was, it was a bit tough because my, they traveled with me and it wasn't typical homeschool, but I eventually I had to, to, to change my schedule or I would have never been able to train. You got to look back now and say, wow, my parents had foresight <laughs> that you would need a legitimate education. Correct. And I think, I think it's great that they were never really sports focused. They were, you know, they, they kind of, they want, they, they, they're hard workers themselves. So they made sure that if we were doing this and giving up so much, you know, financially living apart that I was going to work hard, very hard, but never to the point where I felt like I couldn't say, nah, I don't want to do this anymore. They would have been fine. Which is a gift. Yeah. It really, it's a gift. You started, God, it seems like forever, but you started commentating in 2010. Mm -hmm. How hard was it to learn to be, and I I went through this myself, to be honest about what you were seeing? Because I go back and think about the red carpets, and it takes you a minute to find your groove, especially working live. But then you also, as we did with fashion, as much as we had fun, you also have to be honest. And, it, and it's a learning curve. You know, I remember when I first started commentating, it's a, it's a hard job to get in figure skating just because, you know, these commentators last a very long time. They're, they're, they're legends themselves and it's a cycle, but I, I really wanted to try because I felt like it was going to give me that same, like live television was going to give me that same adrenaline rush. It's such an adrenaline rush. Yeah. So I'm always looking for that since I retired from skating and live okay. television hit the spot. Mm-hmm. So I, at first, it's funny because I put on the headset and people are talking your ear and, and I'm like, why did I choose this? Why didn't I do something like very chill? Like what? And I realized, oh, it's because like you actually live <laughs> for that yeah. feeling. Um, but yeah, I think in the beginning, you know, I watched all of the great commentators of figure skating, their videos, their tapes. And 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 then I realized and I, I remember talking to someone, I they were like, you just take that all in. But when you put that headset on, you have to just be you. Or it's not going to be genuine. It's not going to be right. It's not going to feel authentic. And so I just winged it and just was was myself and really hoped that what I was saying, you know, as truthful as I had to be was never going to come across as, you know, or hurt a skater's feelings. But at the same time, you have to you have to tell it like it is. Yeah, you have to be critical. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have to you have to critique and analyze. That is my job. So there, there's always a fine line, and I've been there, so I know what it's like. And I think there's a certain way that it can be done. And I try, you know, I try to do my best, but sometimes we just gotta call it like it is. So I want to go back to the first time you work live, and I always joke. I don't know if you can do this, where you can be having a conversation with someone and you can literally be listening to a conversation across the room at the same time. I'm always like, because there's always multiple voices in my head. Yeah. But it, it drives people crazy. So, because you're like, you in the middle of a conversation, you could be like, yeah, that's that, that, that. And then you can come right back to where you were. Exactly, I mean, which is, it's, it, it must just happen over time. It I'm does. I'm sure you feel this way, but you don't even realize it's happening. But today I was doing a satellite tour and I, I didn't even realize it till the interview was over because I'm so used to so many things happening that another show was playing in my ear, like something got disconnected. Another show was playing in my ear and then I was getting questions like very faintly over that and and you just get so used to it, yeah. you don't even notice. <laughs> oh yeah, my friends still make fun of me that I can, again, have a conversation and answer a question that two people over are talking to me. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, how can you do both? I'm like, years of voices in my this. head. <laughs> exactly. So you and Johnny Weir, I like to think of you as the Joan and Melissa of ice skating. Right? Oh my God. <laughs> that's, that's so great. <laughs> you are. Even with the fashion. Oh my uh, Was there chemistry between you guys the very first time you were on air? 
there, there was, and, you know, we, we knew of each other. Skating is a small world, but we didn't know each other very well before we came together to commentate. And we weren't even supposed to commentate together. He was supposed to take the men's and I was taking the women's. And that whole year, we just hang out in the, the studio hallways waiting. And we just started talking and it was just instant. It was like that very casual where you feel like, you know, this person. And, and we realized obviously our life experience is so similar, but it's like when you talk to someone that lived your life and in the same way and thinks about things in the same way that you do and has that same perspective and sense of humor. And I was like, this is my soulmate. Yeah. <laughs> this is it. Sort of. He's your <laughs> spirit animal. Yes. Okay. Do you ever, like, I, I know even when I just see pictures of him, I and he did fashion police with me, I covet his handbag collection. He has the best handbag collection of all time. How many Birkins do you think he has? I think he switches them out, but he he has, you know, a good amount. He loves an Hermes bag. Yes, and, yes, he does. And he and I are like this with that. Well, what's funny is I always teased him because I would say, like, I am never spending that amount of money on a bag. We He'd take me to Hermes every place he'd go, and, and I just thought he was crazy. And I always said, never would I do that. And then we were in Tokyo this last year or two years ago, I guess, at this point for the Olympics. And he went in and I went with him and I usually go, I go for like the tea and the chocolates that they bring right. and, and they pull out this bag. That's just so stunning. And it's this creamy white color. And I'm like, Oh my God. Which I one? Love Which that. one? It was, Is it, was it a Birkin? Was it a Kelly? Was it a Constance? What was it? Was, it? it was a Birkin. And I just, it, it was like creamy vanilla and it was just so beautiful with gold hardware and I left and I was like, Johnny, I want, I, I want one, I think. And he's like, just let's do it. Let's splurge. Let's do it. He's like, I'm going to call them. I'm going to see if they have another one. And he's like, it's unlikely. There was only two in the country. Somehow Johnny figured this out. And then they called me and they were like, we actually have another one if you'd like it. And I didn't know what to do because now I was put on the spot. And this was like a purchase that I just thought I would never, ever make in my entire it's, life. It's, it's an investment. Yes. I just was like, this is so silly. What am I doing? But I did it. And now we have matching, obnoxiously, we have matching <laughs> ones. Um, and, but it's okay. I feel, I always tell them because I'm still nervous about it, but I'm like, you know what? I haven't bought a bag since it's fine. I'm making up for it. <laughs> yeah. I bought after my mom died, I, I bought a green, like this beautiful Malachite green Birkin. And I remember calling my business manager and saying, can I do this? And he said, yes, but don't make a habit of it. Yep. Yep. I'm terrified to buy another bag now because I'm like, I need to pay that bag off. It's got to <laughs> be so good about it. You two shopping has to be hilarious. It is. It is hilarious. And we've also got to the point, um, you know, where we tr travel and pack and we don't even call each other anymore we kind of I know what he's gonna I know the four different outfits the type that he's gonna bring he knows what I'm gonna bring we know the colors we like and then we match them all up when we get there and it's just so seamless now that it's it's hilarious because <laughs> I read that in 2018 you bought basically you two brought your entire wardrobes to the to, to the games yeah, we, we brought a lot. We brought a lot. I mean, they expect a lot of different outfits. Well, you've also set, you guys have set yourself up for this. Well, that's the this. problem. We really have, you know, you do one interview and then you go to another and they expect you to be, well, okay, what are you wearing to this one? Cause this is what you do. And then you're, you're like, well, I don't know. I'm gone for three weeks somewhere. How do I have 40 outfits? Oh yeah. And do you hang the tags on them with them yep. labeled? Yeah, we'll sometimes do that. We we get the luggage racks inside. And then because we also have to match, which makes it even more complicated. Well, it's hard to match with him. It is, but we always find a way. We always have a theme. We always have colors that we coordinate with. It's our little thing. It's, it, it, as skaters, you you had to present on the ice. So I think yes. we're so used to this that when we go on air, we're like, okay, we have to show up. <laughs> it's hilarious. That's hilarious to me because everybody who travels like that, you have the tags or you have the photos. Yeah. You yep. always, and like when I would do a press tour, everything would be labeled, hung together, yes. all that stuff. And people don't get that. It's like, and you're changing multiple times a day. And because you guys have set yourself up as the fashion people, there's more pressure. There's more pressure. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's a lot now, but we've actually pared down our suitcases because like I said, we've, 
streamlined it where we actually know what we're going to wear. And sometimes now we'll just show up and, and he'll just be like red. And I, we just figure it out. <laughs> right. What happens when someone doesn't like what the other one is wearing? I could There's see you being me. gentle about it. I could see him sending you back to change. Yeah. So, well, what's great, Johnny is also the ultimate gentleman. So if there's something that like we both, he wants to wear this and I want to wear this. And I'm like, but Johnny, I feel more comfortable in this. He will, he's amazing. He's 100%, whatever you want. He's, he's the best work hubby and, and life hubby, even though I have a husband. I'm sure your husband's <laughs> thrilled to hear that. Uh, as, as you can get. So he's great with that. And there are times like I'm very gentle, but there was like, we, we laugh because he always will gauge Ha like if he's gone too far by me and we have this running joke and he's always like you know you always give me this sweet answer and I know okay I'm pushing it and then he's like sometimes it's just the look and I know I've gone too far and I got to go back and change <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about your new show wedding talk yes you you come across always so like joyous and happy it feels like this was a perfect match for you it really was. When I got this offer, I thought, this is my dream job. Seriously. Like, I love hosting. I love broadcast. I love sports. I love my sport. But to be able to talk about love and weddings and events and decor, that is just so up my alley. And I am a hopeless romantic. And planning my own wedding, I was so involved. I loved every part of it. I still th I'm the person that still thinks and talks way too much about the wedding. And, you know, can't wait to do vow renewals someday. So this, per th this, this show is really a perfect match for me. It's on Chicken Soup for the Soul, but explain to people what the show is. Yeah, so it's on Chicken Soup for the Soul, but also Crackle. So if you just download those apps to your TV, you'll, you'll stream it for free. But it is, um, it's a really cool concept because it's not just your traditional wedding or traditional wedding videos that you might think of. And when I sat down in the chair the first time and watched the films, because I, I have to call them films now, because it is not a wedding video. It no. blew me away. My husband's a doc director. And when he watched it, he's like, oh my goodness, this footage is stunning. So visually it's beautiful, but also the way that they put the, the films together and incorporate the couple's love story is so emotional. I had Kleenex there every day. And Okay, so let me take you through what the show is. We, we follow probably about three couples each episode. The, each episode has a theme. We'll take you on big extravagant weddings, destination weddings, backyard weddings, isolated uh, locations where, where people get married in front of a, a volcano uh, erupting. So we, we kind of span across the spectrum for every type of wedding there is. Um, and then you just get to know about the couple. And we also work with... Joe Meyer and Jose Rolone, who are incredible wedding planners themselves, and they're on the show. And I just have them help us break down everything: what's trending, what's hot, what's not. And um, the inspiration you you get from watching these episodes is so fun. I'm so mad that this show wasn't around <laughs> when I was getting married. Okay, what wedding no nos have you learned? That when sometimes when you're watching these videos, you're like, oh god, this isn't going to end well. <laughs> well, some of them don't end well, and some of them, because they don't end well, are more charming, and I find that when I look back on the episodes, I'm like, oh, the, that poor couple that sat in torrential rain right. and just kept going, somehow, like, it was the sweetest thing. And right. My cousin had to, and his wife had to move their wedding into a Chinese restaurant because there was a, there was a, a blizzard. Yeah, like, you can't, you can't account for for all the things that can go wrong wrong in a wedding because so many things can go wrong and we do we do one episode where we kind of go through everything that that goes wrong in a wedding but I think what I liked about this show is just it, again it's not it's not a it's not just a traditional wedding it's it's really getting to know these couples and they give you ideas because each person each partner is so different with what they want for their special day that for me, I thought, oh, I had it all the personalized touches in my wedding and I wasn't even close. After watching this show, I'm like, I need to redo it. <laughs> I need to redo it. Because <laughs> I always think, you know, you can see things coming. You're like, oh, oh, this isn't going to be good. Do you think you've become sort of an expert in that? You know, I have, but I feel also like as I get older, I kind of love when things go wrong and then... <laughs> It's, it's almost the, the imperfect part of it makes it more perfect to me. 
you know, and, and I think like watching these episodes, there's some weddings that are just, oh, they went off without a hitch. It was just gorgeous. It was perfect. And then there's ones where, yeah, it was a, <laughs> flying by the seat of your pants, but all of them, that's why the Kleenex was next to me. I just tears like, and this is the best part of the show. Usually I'm talking skating and I get emotional with that, but this is a whole new level. <laughs> what would you change about your wedding now that, that you've moved into sort of this level of expertise? I know, you know, it's hard because I think back and again, I love everything that happened to our wedding, good, bad, you know, all of it, um, because it was ours, but there's things that I get confused about because I'll see these weddings, you know, that are these couples like uh, getting married on top of a glacier and the, what they do with their photos and what they do with the day is just so special. And I'm like, Todd, maybe we should have just gotten married alone like that. And we didn't meet. And then on the other hand, then I see this other wedding with 300 people and I'm oh my God, they thought to do that with all their guests. Like, I want to do that too. And he's like, you, you can't just have all, like, what do you want to do? Do you just want to have a wedding every week? I'm like, probably. (laughs) (laughs) How did you and Todd meet? We met, um, so we met at the sports Emmys. He was accepting an Emmy and I was there with NBC presenting an Emmy to him. So we actually have a photo of him getting his Emmy and I didn't meet him that night. And then his aunt is Chris Jansing, who works for um, NBC, and I met through the Olympics. And um, she emailed me. She's like, do you know you gave a, an Emmy to my nephew? He actually lives in L.A. And so she set us up over email, and that was it. Wow. Six How many years later, now? Six months later, we were engaged. And then we were together two years before we, while planning the wedding. And so all together, seven years, but married five. And do you still love it every day? You know, you know what I do, like marriage to me is like this, obviously it's this ever evolving thing that you look back to those first honeymoon days and you're like, oh my God, that was so amazing. But the more that we've gone through and, you know, we've gone through a lot together. um, It's just that like warm, fuzzy feeling of this is your person and you get through the hard stuff and you get through everything that life throws at you. You know, I've had a hard couple of years with a lot of other things. And he's just been there by my side, you know, as my rock. And I don't, you know, I can't imagine life without him. Yeah. Cause you've been, you brought that up. You've been very vocal or open about some of your health struggles. Yes. Why and, did, what compelled you to do that? Well, you know, I haven't even, I haven't told the whole story yet just cause I need to personally, you know, get to a good, good place, but I have struggled you know, the last couple of years with so many different things, um, health wise and, um, endo was, you know, the, the basis and a large part of that. And, um, you know, I struggled with that probably for, for years and, and, and was just misdiagnosed. And it's so sad because women with endometriosis on an average, it takes about 10 years to get diagnosed because again, it's a woman's health issue. It's kind of just pushed to the side. It's like, oh, you have a, a painful cramp. No worries, <laughs> you know, and yeah. you, you you don't realize that this is, you know, a serious disease that is painful and, and can affect the quality of your life. It is it is a people, again, women's health is a whole separate podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're so cheerful and Am so, <laughs> yeah, and so light. And I mean, this show is such a perfect match for you. Are there days you ever want to close the door and put your face in a pillow and scream? Because you're not, your, your image is so bubbly. You're almost not allowed to have a bad day somewhere. Yeah. You know, I definitely do. And I give myself the grace to do that. I'm, I find, you know, I always say this to my friends. I find that I don't ever feel depressed. If anything, I feel anxious. <laughs> I'm a worry wart. I channel all of that energy into anxiety. And, um, you know, I may not go sit in my room and, and, and just, you know, be untouched for, for days on end. But I find that, you know, now being able to go to my support group of friends and family and Todd and, you know, when all these worries seem overwhelming, you know, I'm, I'm not always (laughs) the most cheerful person and it's okay to have those days and, and get through that. And, you know, it's part of life, right? Everyone's got their. (laughs) I'm scared to ask because like I said, you have so many different lines on your resume. What's next (laughs) other than promoting the show? 
So, you know, I always, I, I always feel like if I sit too long in one thing, I get so antsy. I'm always ready for the next thing. And um, sometimes I feel like I take things on that I'm terrified of because then I'm like, wait, what did I want to do and get myself into? I, I know nothing about this, but I, again, from skating, I think I learned to wing it and either it works or it doesn't. But um, the probably the, the most recent thing that we've been having a lot of fun with is my husband is a, a director and we last year uh, put together a four-part series for Peacock called Meddling. Um, and we did it together. I executive produced and he directed and it was so much fun to work together and form this production company. And I think, you know, I definitely want to to dip my toe more into to those waters where we can work together and, and think of really interesting and, and, you know, engaging projects. Well, Tara, it is always a joy to talk to you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Everyone needs to check out the new show uh, on Crackle and on Chicken Soup for the Stol- Soul, both streaming platforms. And the show is called Wedding Talk. I can't wait to, to sit down and watch all my episodes. Oh, thank you so much. 